Hello everybody. Uh, this talk is fully titled Community Principles Powering the Largest Ever Handcraft in Virtual Worlds. I have to put in a disclaimer, we think. Uh, it's very hard to quantify something like that. First of all, I'll start. Hi, I'm Mars. Uh, I do quite a few things, uh, most notably and related to this conference. I'm on the executive of the AUC. This is my first year serving, but I've been uh, for quite a while involved in running the Dev World Conference, so one of the other worlds. Uh, I also am a UTAS student. I work at UTAS. I'm not here in that capacity, uh, much like Tony Gray, who you might all know. Uh, and I do some other things, mostly around AI, but this is about a passion project. I'm here to talk to you today about West Dresscraft. Uh, and it's a hobby of mine. What is it? In more concrete terms, we have a long official fact that gives you a big technical explanation of what it is. Basically, we're going to build, or we tend to build, the entire world from the fictional universe Game of Thrones in Minecraft. <laughs> this is the, the part of the world that everyone knows. It's a big popular HBO show. It's most notable for killing lots of characters, having lots of nudity, and being very, very expensive per episode to produce lots of dragons. Uh, but we actually follow more closely the A Song of Ice and Fire book series that it's based on. It's still ongoing. In fact, I think the, uh, a new one was released maybe this week or last week, so the internet's going mental. Uh, our server has been mentioned in everywhere. It's actually currently showing in the VNA Museum in London in the uh, Create, Play, Disrupt, might be saying that wrong, but they have a video games exhibit, uh, which we are a tiny part of, along with some games by, made by some people I know and some other very, very talented people, so we feel very, very lucky. Uh, if you have seen us before, you probably know us by pictures like this that will pop up over the internet, but these are actually really old, and we've styled up and, and skilled up in the last couple of years, and now we look more like this. Uh, this is actually way, way bigger than the first one, so we've done most things twice. What most people don't know is that the whole project is huge. Uh, and here's a quote it's from the first time we made it into the Guinness World Records. But this was actually, as you might see, 2015, when we were 800 square kilometers, which already then was breaking records. But three years later, we're closer to 1,300 square kilometers. For those of you who don't want to do the maths, that's about 1.3 billion square meters. This is about the size of Rome, and no, not the tiny bit of Rome that you can see in this picture. It's more like all of Rome. <laughs> and that's because this massive city that you can see before, that has about 5,000 houses within the ha walls alone, is actually only a tiny, tiny part of the world we have built. And it's an even smaller part of the world we want to build in this fictional universe. So while there are definitely games that technically have bigger maps, they all involve procedural generation in some way. And that's particularly notable for Minecraft, where the terrain itself is generated, and we say handcrafted worlds because we made every scrap of wilderness. Every single tree, every rock, every piece of grass, we made. There is no vanilla generation. We start with a map that then gets painted upon. Every, every square. It's been going for seven years, and a couple of days it has its birthday, uh, and it's been contributed to by a bunch of people, including me. <laughs> uh, one of the early Australians. So. Before you say, well, it's not about the size of cows, it's about the content, well, let's have a look again at our map, and then you mark every town or castle. Not very helpful. Let's zoom in a bit. Well, still not really. <laughs> it's full of stuff. Uh, so I'm going to read this to you verbatim, because it is very important. It is a colossal task. It has lots of people involved, many with different views, most of whom are quite young. They're either high school age or retiree age, we find, because they're often people that have a lot of free time all of whom are very passionate and invested because it's based on this franchise. They're working independently because nobody can watch all the time zones and all the people. They have no compensation, not much recognition. It's a very niche interest. They have the requirement to make a cohesive whole that adheres to high but largely undefined quality standards and get all done, even the laborious, lousy bits. So this might sound familiar to anyone who's done anything very topically from some of the talks this morning in open source or any community art projects, which might be similar to some of the stuff featured here today. It's because, largely, people kind of suck at working together. <laughs> uh, but at our server, we've historically really gotten along, not always perfectly, and I always say, disclaimer, I'm in the off time zone, so I see a lot less of it than there might be, but we really get along. Uh, and I might point out that that doesn't mean that we all agree with each other as people. I was in that discourse server the other day where there were some Americans talking about the US midterms. I do not believe in their opinions. <laughs> But we get along as people in this project. And that's not just because we codified our community values from the get-go in our definition of the project. It's because we have naturally evolved these particular strategies and processes throughout the time of the project. 
that really work for us. So I'm going to focus on a couple of these key areas and talk about them today. Not necessarily saying they'll work for you, but they have worked for us, and I think it's a really interesting case study. So starting off with planning an organization, the thing that we really drive home is that we want to establish ground truth. And that is to always have a thing that you can refer to. It's like if you're that person that really wants to win arguments on the internet, you need that thing that backs you up. <laughs> so it doesn't mean that we're going to go back to the original books and find the canon, the source material for every single time we want to get any fact about anything. We can't even go to the uh, <laughs> intermediate material, like the very well maintained Wiki of Ice and Fire. We don't make this, but the people who make this make our job a whole lot easier. They're very, very good. Uh, but we actually make a document for each and every town project that contains all of our canonical uh, research that then becomes the source of all layout and style plans from then on. So this contains everything from historical sources for periods that had uh, comparable architecture and technology, technology that we can logically infer was about the inspiration for the author when they were constructing this fantastical place, uh, and also examples of layouts and the style of different houses that are going to go there and everything, and this becomes this big bible for a project. Uh, and they can get very, very long. And some of them, they require some intermediate documentation, like in the case of Old Town, which I'm sure you won't know what it is. But this is an enormous table. It goes on of every single time it's mentioned in the books, color-coded by what source they came from. <laughs> but you can't rely on everyone in your team always being massive documentation nerds. We just happen to be. Uh, so most of our stuff gets done in extensive discussion where people come along and they offer their nugget of information, the bit they're passionate about, and that becomes their domain, it sparks a discussion. And the thing that we really have going for us is people will talk about what they think. I think this is really important, particularly for very odd things. Like we had one guy who did all of the sewers under our main city, and he was super, super passionate about it. He brought all of the historical knowledge about how sewers worked. And he led it with, then other people got involved, but it, it's just a really great example of one person who was really interested in this one thing that other people might think is a crappy job, and loved it, and nailed it, and it's awesome. Uh, and so for each project, we also have a project lead, who then becomes that domain expert, <laughs> <laughs> uh, who then becomes like an intermediate, like baby moderator for that project, for that team, for that small amount of time. So that we don't have one person that's trying to monitor everything, because we have normally about 14 moderators, they can't cover every moment, every time zone. Sometimes we have 40 projects ongoing at once. So we have these intermediate leaders. But the most important and substantive thing that we do is we test things in advance. We don't go, I bet we can build this enormous town. We build bits of it to go, yes, here, I've proved I can build this enormous town because I did bits. So we have a test world where every builder, currently approved builder, has about 200 by 200 blocks, which is their block to build whatever they like on. And people will fill it with test builds examples, facades, style tests of stuff that they want to apply for and stuff they want to leave. And of course they all have personal tattoos. You can see mine's in the middle here, Mars. Uh, people will write their names on them, have little houses. So when you go into this world, you type a command, it warps you to a certain place, you just teleport there. So people will build nice little houses around where you appear when you teleport. It says, welcome to my plot, I'm working on this. Uh, and there are some fan things, like you'll find Dragon Ball Z characters and stuff around test. <laughs> but then we also have the public areas of test where we test the basics but then become a repository for content that we can use elsewhere. So we have things like tree test. And these are all different sizes and permutations of existing breeds of tree. And people will go and do shifts in tree tests, building trees that then get painted onto the landscape. Uh, we have this for everything from like rock test, which is behind there, which I didn't take screenshots of because it's not that interesting. It's a bunch of rocks. But we have to have things like ship test, where we build all of our ships. This is some of the most extensive research that people do is into our ships. The kind of people who can build a ship in Minecraft is a very particular kind of skill, which I don't personally have. Uh, everything down to the kind of paths that will appear in different regions with different weather and different amounts of use. We have tests for how to represent different kind of machinery in Minecraft blocks and how to build different kinds of supports that will keep a structure up, different kinds of overhangs, everything. The most pedantry you can imagine. And then for each particular notable build, we'll have tests of things that are unique and crucial to that. So for High Garden, which if anyone has seen the show, is this big rich house that's known for their golden topiary mazes of roses and everything about gardens, obviously. Uh, and they were notable for fountains and marble statues throughout the gardens. We went, well, we really can't nail this High Garden thing unless we can nail those. So we tested a bunch of those first. Uh, so test was filled with a bunch of pretty gardens for a while. It was very nice. But also we make things called miniatures. And you might be able to see that this is about one block. This is not very big. 
And then people can test out different layouts because it's a whole lot easier to decide that you like this layout or this layout or this layout or to change something at this scale before it turns into this. If you want to move a tower, that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> so we have this really key process that's evolved naturally uh, of how you go from theory to a whole town uh, under the, the guise of that one person's lead, that one town project. And so you start with researching the canon for that place, you make some miniatures or decide on the layout, label some key things, then you make some fake facade tests which will show unfurnished examples in substantive examples of what different classes of houses will look like in different regions of town. You make that big document which you get to make look as much as pretty as you like, but whatever it is you like, you usually include a resume of the stuff you've led before. Uh, and some people make these just beautiful, total document nerds. But then, as I said, some people are about 14 and they're not really familiar with designing a structured document. So some of them can be very, very basic, but it's teaching them those skills and they still get the point across because they know that you make this document, and then you have some, some discussions, and then they decide if they approve your proposition to lead this place, and that's where your ability to control it stops, because then you plot the place, and you give people examples, and you have the document that you can refer people to, and then any person that's been approved as builder can build there. And you have no control over who goes, who builds what, and you can give minor feedback, but that's where your control ends. So it's really, really in your own best interest to make these documents and these Sources of ground truth, really, really good, really detailed. So sometimes we put things like, this is going to be a raft maker, and it's going to be a middle class house, and it's going to have a, a gray wooden roof, maybe. And that's about the detail you get. And they could build any house there, and it could turn into something like this, or something like this one. And it's really cool to see the different variants between different builders and their own personal styles adapting from the same source material because the skills that people have on the server is not their amazing builders all the time, though many of them are, but it's really good at taking a style and adapting it, making 400 of something slightly different with the same flavor that's not the same. So there's a process where people will build, and people will discuss, and people will build, and some people will complain, and then eventually a moderator will come along and go, this town, this project is done. You did what you said in your project brief, your, your proposal, you didn't install a second King's Landing right in the middle, it's great. And it gets done. Uh, but of course during that process you need some decision making and conflict resolution techniques. So again we have our trusty forums which everyone discusses everything in, we gibber all day, but we also have some clear community rules and the golden rule is don't be an ass hat. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if that word offends you. Uh, but we also know that that's not enough, you need to be specific, we have people coming from all over the world, all different backgrounds, history, culture, experience. So we have some gameplay rules that tell you that you don't destroy things, don't do things that are going to lag the server out, uh, don't impersonate people. Give constructive feedback is a really important one, but it's key that when people log into the server for the first time, you can explore. You cannot break anything. The people that visit us can open doors, they can push buttons, they can pull levers, and they can get into and out of places. They can't break or place blocks. To do that, you have to apply. So we have rules that say, if you manage to circumvent this, that's against the rules, <laughs> just in case. But then we also have community rules, which tell you that don't be an ass hat. <laughs> uh, so we have some pretty specific rules about stuff that you're not allowed to talk about, because we used to have an age limit, but we don't now. We kept having people lie about it. So we need to make sure that this is a safe place where people feel safe. And a crucial one is we picked a point in the timeline where the, the, this world occurs so that we don't have to keep updating it as the story happens. But also this kind of, every so often it will expand to include things like don't spoil the new Star Wars movie. Because <laughs> we're all a bunch of nerds and we're there to talk about the stuff that we mostly all like and we're just trying to have a good time. And that's why it's really important that along with our rules we have clear procedure and consequences that go along with them. We say in text that we favor the spirit of the law over the letter of the law that if you do this, this will happen. And we have a hierarchy of consequences that, that will happen to you if you do X, Y, or Z, that the first time you'll be warned. And then you might be muted so you can't speak in chat for half an hour. And then you might be kicked from the server and banned for an hour. Um, and usually if you're, you're a builder, that's about how it will go. There might be seven different steps which eventually go to you'll be banned forever and you won't be a builder. But we make it very clear that you're the first time visitors to the server who've never heard of you and you say something mean. You might get one warning and then you might be banned forever. And I was actually there the other day when someone came on and said the N-word in a 
Joe, who had never been on before and was kicked immediately. And there was like a two minute discussion about how that was not okay. Is everyone still on the server good? Yeah, we're good. That's a bit funny. Okay, on with that day. And th this is from a bunch of effectively kids sometimes. Like lots of them are my age, I'm 25, but there are definitely people on there that are becoming well above their age from having these experiences and they almost grow up on the server. But we also have things that mean you cannot miss the rules. When you first spawn onto our server, you wake up in a dungeon. <laughs> and it says, you face here. This is it. the first thing you see when you open your eyes. Please read the signs before you leave the building. And as you wave, wave your way out of this maze that is this dungeon, you walk past signs that tell you each of these rules. So you can't say, I didn't go onto the forums, I didn't see them. You can't say, in my country, no one's ever told me not to be racist. <laughs> uh, there is no claiming you didn't know. And that's very, very important. But then also, we occasionally have people that are just troublemaking, and we don't really see that as the same thing as someone being properly offensive, but we also have the, you're just annoying everybody, so in the middle of the desert we have a pit no. <laughs> that we can chuck you in, take your powers away, and make you do a jump puzzle to get out. And usually by the time they've gotten out, they've raged out of whatever they were angry over, and <laughs> now they're more angry at the pit. Uh, we also have some methods of quality control, because as I've really expressed, I think the, the diversity of the people that are involved in this project, you know, we, we don't all know each other, even beyond our Minecraft names. And you still need to know that this project isn't going to require us to go and handhold everybody. So we have a rank system. So we have the no build. So with people who just showed up, they can't build. But also, since I joined as well, this didn't used to exist, we have the new builder rank, which means if you went through the process that says, I want to be a builder, you get approved as a builder, you don't become a full builder, and you can't lead projects yet for about a month. Uh, so you have this new builder phase where you are on probation. And they assign you a probation leader, which is somebody who's been a builder for quite a long time. And you post in your probation thread, I built a house here. And your probation leader will go and look at it and give you feedback as a continuation of the, the application process. And then after a month, if they think that you're contributing and you're taking feedback and everything, and you're integrating with the community, then you become a proper builder. And if you do well at that, you can excel upwards. And we also have other ranks, which happen if you demonstrate some contribution the community or you're, you're really good at managing people after some time you can move upwards but it's really important that these aren't seen as an automatic extension of builder you don't move up the ladder to these things necessarily it's an extra thing that's awarded to you if you do well so we have a lot of issues on other Minecraft servers where people will join and they'll be like I want to be an admin I'll stomp around they'll destroy stuff and really get to be an admin <laughs> whereas here the couple of admins we have everyone knows why there's admins they're very, very good. They've been there for a long time. They're great at diffusing people. And they have this great long-term view and a, a broad perspective. That really is why they were chosen for that. Uh, so our application system looks like this. This is going to be very tiny. But basically, you just say, we have some demographic questions, which is, I'm from this country, and I'm this age, and I've read these books or seen this part of Game of Thrones. To check you even know what the places are called, we ask you if you like any other fantasy series. And then you attach some images of stuff you have built in Minecraft, uh, to say, this is something that I took an example from your server, and I made a house, because that's what you'd be doing on the server. And a really key part of that is this line, which you probably would have noticed in the middle, which is, there is no guarantee on how long an application will take to be approved. So everything is worded as, you don't get rejected. You just might keep getting feedback and keep being issued new challenges until eventually you get approved. And generally, people will either decide that they're annoyed that they got feedback and they don't take feedback very well, or they will go absent for some reason, usually something happening in, the, in their real life, and their applications will time out. But not that many people are rejected unless they actually said something offensive which blew up on the forums. There are people who went through like 10 rounds of challenges to eventually get approved. And by the time they get there, they really want it. And that kind of leads into my next point, which is, about onboarding. The first thing that people get when they get approved as a builder is they get one of the top people in the server will welcome them and tell them what to do next. And every person gets an individualized message that comes from a different admin or maester, so moderator, who was the person that was handling their application individually. You get one person who you can message and talk to about how you're doing well. And so we have this slightly complex application process where a moderator approves approves builder application, so you go from a no build to a new build, and then eventually after a builder decides you're good enough, you go from a new build to a builder, and if builders demonstrate admirable qualities, it might turn to moderators, but basically it boils down to 
probation is a really sensitive concept and it's really hard to do that process right of basically telling someone we don't trust you yet we want you to get better you're not one of us yet but we want you to work as if you are but if you can do onboarding right it can define your community if people have this positive experience as they're coming into your community then that defines what they think of the community and how you treat each other there and our process i think is a really positive one and then leading on from that then the quality control just becomes again about talking about things we talk to people who we think have been away for a while and maybe need to polish up their skills or where we disagree with each other's interpretations of canon and then all of this quality control then becomes a democracy again uh, but we have a pretty unique system which is that all our feedback is melons melons, melons. <laughs> uh, and that is we leave melon blocks on people's stuff so if you find something you don't like on someone's house whether it's your town or not anywhere in the world you leave a melon on it and you put a sign <laughs> Uh, this is not a particularly helpful one. I'm pretty sure that's a bird's nest. But <laughs> melons are left around uh, to tell people, I think the chimney on this house is wrong or whatever. And the really good thing about this is this is a public feedback system like any other, and it discourages pettiness, it discourages bias, and it discourages duplicate criticism. Because if you do it in messages, you might have someone going, I don't like your chimney. And then there's a person who's built the same chimney and they don't say anything to them and you feel like you're personally attacked or even if they did say the same thing to them, you don't know they did so you feel personally attacked. Or you might have five people messaging you going, I don't like your chimney and you're like, wow, what did my chimney do to you? Uh, and this is a really good way to make sure that you've communicated your point and they've got it. You know that, that when they come back to the house, which they would have to to finish it, they're going to see that melon. No one can say they didn't see it. It's the same process for everybody. And as a side effect, no one really takes anything a melon says too seriously. So you can say, this is the ugliest house I've seen. And also be like, oh, melon. <laughs> then we get into engagement. Uh, we don't really have clear numbers for how many people have been involved in our project over the years. This is from our fact. Every single person goes, yeah. Uh, but we do have stats on about how many people have visited. So this is actually only since 2015. So we've got lots and lots of unique visitors, given that Maybe a quarter to three quarters of people, depending on which time zone, online will be builders. But during our big server builds, like we say we're building the Eerie, if anyone knows from Game of Thrones, it's one of the capitals, then we'll have like a hundred strangers turn, on, turn up and watch us. And sometimes we hit the, the server cap where not, no more people can join to watch us do our thing. We have to start kicking people to let builders in to contribute. Uh, but we find that it's really hard to keep people engaged when they're not part of the team, but you really have to make them part of the team because gatekeeping does not feel good. It can't be, we're builders and you're not a builder. So we have these community portals like anyone else does. We have one of like every social media account ever. And I actually used to run their Instagram. That was really fun. I don't have time for it anymore, but it's still a really, really cool account. Uh, but we offer mixed roles. So if you're not a great builder, you don't have to be a builder. We have other roles like you could be a coder. You could write our, our custom mods and modify it. Uh, our custom launcher, we have artists who do all our textures and our promo materials especially, as you might see. Uh, I've got an exhibit happening over there about this later. And some of the promo materials that we have on our website and everything were just done for free by community members who are very, very skilled in a number of ways. We also have people who just investigate law. And then people who post on the forums to go, actually, rivers in the 1800s work differently like this <laughs> post this really obscure fact some of them are really really unique it's very very cool but as a bottom line no matter what rank you are people don't work for free and if you can't see some tangible benefit that they're getting from it then the thing they're working for is enjoyment or satisfaction and so we have activities for people to do we have an area uh, in test which is called Playground. You can build whatever. You can demonstrate your skills at Minecraft outside of this specific medieval stage. So we have people building like country towns from westerns. And if anyone played Skyrim, this is the beginning of Riften from Skyrim, which I think has been in progress for years. It's really hard. And the time we built Hoth for yeah. April Fools, <laughs> <laughs> the Battle of Hoth. <coughs> we have things like this is the gates, the entrance to Lannisport, the city, which we took a big chunk of and then blew up with big siege weapons and made it like a PvP map that you can run through, it's all full of fire and cannons and stuff, it's quite fun. But then we need activities that everyone can get involved in, because again, people who don't have build permissions can't break things. So then we have things like contests, where you sign up on the forums and even if you're not a builder, you can get build permissions for your blocking context. And this actually serves a new purpose, which is that we give these broad themes that people contribute all sorts of things to, down from this tiny island, these big structures, 
down to terraforming. But we actually have contest themes that allow people to test for areas that we have yet to build and yet to develop a style for. So all of a sudden we have like 400 people contribute their contest entry for the chance to win like a t-shirt. And now we've got 400 examples of a style that we could use in that new area. Um, and then of course we have discussions. So we have this person actually popped up the other day to say, I love Duskendale. Love House, du House Darkland of Dus Duskendale and I've compiled this enormous, enormous PDF of everything I know about Duskendale for when you're going to redo Duskendale eventually, here's all the information I have. I can't be a builder, but Here's my passion project. So we will contribute in all sorts of ways. And together, this comes to, we get along. As I said in the beginning, we get along in all these different ways. They don't really seem like they should work, but they do. And I think that there are definitely some lessons to be learned from our server. I would say the key one is time spent planning is rarely wasted. Because something that's really unique about our project is how much time is spent not working on the real thing but nothing is wasted. They get pasted into the real world, or they become examples for things. And we have more fun building the test sometimes than we do building a real thing. Now let's just bond and compete, which sound like they're polar opposite things, but we actually, we community build. Um, and that offering different things that people can do and allowing them to use their own executive decision making to decide this task needs to be done or I enjoy this task more, things eventually all get done. No one had to be made to do anything. And we made this beautiful project. So, thank you for listening. <laughs> um, I would like to acknowledge where my resources came from, particularly Hal, who does all our server renders, which featured both in the slideshow and also on the wall over there, and would also like to tell you some places that you can get other things about Westeros Craft if you would like to know more about or follow the project. And I will be over there. Thank you.